Hey. How is everybody? Good. I am so blessed to be here. Truly, I feel so honored. Thank you, Michelle and Pastor Rick. These guys are the real deal. Amen. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Mark and I and our daughter Zoe got in on Wednesday night from Australia and um, we just felt, really felt in God that we were supposed to be here with you and I'm just so glad we have had the best time. I want to give you a little greeting from my family back at home. Oh, I love my family. I've got a little photo of them. They're so cute. Okay, my husband and I, and that's Chloe and her husband, Hosanna. He's Cambodian. We have little Ava Pearl, who is now seven. Zoe Jewel, who is tall. I've got to stop feeding her. Ruthie Feather is the baby that is crying. She's either crying or super happy, nothing in the middle. That's Andrew, our son in love, and Amy, our eldest daughter, Roman, Emmanuel, Mark Hood, our only grandson. And now that photo was like two years old, so seven months ago, the next photo is Thea May Siv, our first Asian baby. Yes! Yes! We, oh, she's so cute. Anyway, I was just talking to them all and they're so happy and they're like, they're like my own children. They just say, what are you bringing us? No one says they miss me. They're like, so what presents do you have? So everything is healthy and well in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can come boldly and worship tonight. Thank you that you are a God that is a God that can be experienced, not just talked about or known about or not just head knowledge, but you can be fully experienced and we thank you for that. Holy Spirit, we just say you are welcome in this place. You are here with us now, we know it. Thank you for every woman here. No one is here by chance. Everybody is here on assignment by you, Father, and I thank you for that. We just give you the entirety of this night. I pray that my thinking won't get in the way of what you would want to say tonight. Holy Spirit, we love you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, I'm blessed. My life, I'm sure just like yours, has been filled with ups and downs. But after finding Christ at 15, becoming a Christian, I was living out of home at 15. My family had gone through a terrible time and um, through a series of unfortunate events, I found myself living um, in a, renting a room at the back of a single mum's home near a church. My father, who was a backslidden Christian at the time, came to Christ hallelujah, came and picked me up one night and said, honey, I want to take you to youth group. At that, in those days, it was called Royal Rangers. I don't know if you have Royal Rangers here, but I went to Royal Rangers going, what in the world are these people? They were tying knots and I'm like doing camping and things like that. But anyway, at the end of the night, they made an appeal and they said, there is one who will love you more than any of your faults or mistakes. And there is one who will love you to life, to a life that you could only ever dream about and who will forgive you of all your sin. And my little heart, I still remember it from this day as if it was yesterday. My life was radically turned around by the love of God. And I, there was two of us that night, ran down the front. We said yes to Christ. And I've got to tell you, my life has never been the same. I've always known since that day that there was a way through whatever challenge may come my way. I know God's presence and power. I've learned in worship to be immovable in what I see in the natural and to declare and announce what I know. I know in worship how to announce and declare that God is here, amen. I'm married to a man who is faithful to me and to our children and to God's promises over our lives. And as you see in our picture, you know, that's us on our best day. 
Everyone has Instagram photos, right? Us on our best days and all the days in between, I'm just so thankful to God for my family that mean everything to me and to local church. Um, we now pastor a church called Hope Unlimited Church, Hope You See. And that's a long story how God called us out of Hillsong Church. People thought we were crazy. Actually, we thought we were crazy. But you've got to obey God, right? And now part of a global church family like you, who I adore and admire and am so thankful for. On the 10th of December, 2013, however, life took a very unexpected turn. And this lesson is called Lessons from the Valley. And I know that my valley is probably similar to some of your valleys. And some of you have gone through things much more trialing than my valley. But I share from my life experience tonight and about the faithfulness of God, amen? Is anyone here thankful for the faithfulness of God? Yes? <laughs> oh my goodness. I actually went to get a, um, I, I had been chasing this lump in my breast. You know what I mean? After, you know, you're always checking and I'd had three previous checks, not feeling that something, I felt that something was not right. And so my girlfriend and I were actually going Christmas shopping, as you do, multitasking, get a breast check and do the Christmas shopping. <laughs> and um, all the women said, amen. And... When I got there, they said, oh, you need to have one more test, just wait. And I'm like, oh, hurry up, you know, I've only got so many hours. And um, they had another test and it came back inconclusive. And I really felt, I really believe it was the Holy Spirit saying to me, you need to stay. And I said to them, I cannot leave here until I have a conclusive. I need to know if this is cancer or not, no or not. And by the end of the day, they called me back into the office and I was about an hour away from where Zoe was at school and they said, have you got someone who can pick up your daughter? And you know, knowing that I had so many friends who could, I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't have anybody who can pick up my daughter and I must leave right now. And they said, no, you can't leave. We were faced with a diagnosis that rocked our world, faced with many fears. I was walking, I went, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then I'm like, I'm not okay, I'm not okay. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm not okay. And I just fell apart really and fell into my girlfriend's arms and she started singing actually in my ear and I'm like, stop singing, you are the worst singer. <laughs> so funny what happens in the moments. <laughs> just hold me, stop singing. <laughs> Ah, she loves me. <laughs> so what do you do when life throws unexpected trouble your way? You know, my heart tonight is not to really talk about my trouble, but to give you a few little lessons that I've learnt along the way and to give you some hope to carry you through your storm. You know, Jesus not only died for our salvation, but he also came that we would have life and life in all its fullness. And I declare that promise over you. I declare it over my own body every day. Jesus came that we may have life and life in all its fullness. To be honest, you know, I've always loved prayer. I've always loved the closeness of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. I felt like the Holy Spirit raised me for a little while when I was first saved. It was such a precious time. And I thought I knew how to overcome through prayer. But to be honest, girls, I guess I've been a kind of nice prayer. You know, like, dearest Lord, you're so lovely. Thank you. Like even when Mark and I both lost our dads to cancer, too young. And even in that time, I remember praying for them, but I, I had this... I didn't really have a, a fight in me. I'm just, I pleaded with God, but I also, I had this trust over their lives and you know, it, it was a crazy time, a crazy, crazy time. But I found out that when I was praying over myself and thinking of my children and my grandchildren, 
that I needed to learn how to pray with a little bit more <laughs> grit in my gut. I found out I'm a lover, not a fighter. And, you know, that's okay because Jesus told me that he has already won the victory. Amen. He's already won. And... But there was something that rose up in me. And I realized when the enemy comes against you like a flood, the men and women who know their God, they know how to rise up and stand against the enemy. And we don't bring against the enemy flesh and blood fighting. We bring against the enemy the Word of the Lord. And when God says, it is written, my friend, you can guarantee that He stands by His Word. It is written. And I had to learn to pray like I'd never prayed before, to pray in the Spirit, to pray the Word of God and be vigilant in believing God that if His Word says that through Him I have overcome, then yes, I have overcome through Him because He has overcome. I found scriptures that I'd never found before. Psalm 68, but God will smash the heads of the enemies. I'm like, what? That is so wicked. That is so big and bloody and awful. But God's like, no, I have the enemy under my feet. You can rest, you can breathe, girl, you can breathe. He says he crushes the skulls of those who love their guilty ways. I've got to tell you, I found this quite confronting. My beautiful shepherd king also likes to crush heads. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> this is good news. Can I hear a cheer? <laughs> this is good news. I love this scripture. The Lord says, and I will bring down my enemies. I love that. I will bring them up from the depths of the sea for you, my people, will wash your feet in their blood. Even your dogs will get their share. Like my sweet little Chachi is now like a devil eater. <laughs> oh my gosh. But your procession has come into view, oh God. The procession of my God and my King as he goes into the sanctuary. Singers in front, musicians behind, just like we saw tonight. Between them are the young women playing tambourines. Where are you, my Salvation Army friends? <laughs> playing tambourines, I love you, you're amazing. Praise God, praise God. This is an amazing picture. It's a confronting picture, but it's a picture full of hope of God triumphing over His enemies and celebrating all the way home, amen. So a few lessons that I've learned along the way. First lesson came quickly. My attitude in this is going to make or break me. We all have the same opportunity to choose our attitude. It's not that you don't have bad days, but actually I found myself easily this sense of blame. Why didn't someone find this sooner? I've been at so many doctors. I, I could have got angry. I could start to blame people for not finding it sooner or, or, oh, there's an or, making a choice. Or I can do right well. I can do well right now, sorry, jet lag brain, with the information that I now have. So when I went into hospital on the Monday before Christmas, I was feeling scared. And yet I was feeling full of peace at the same time. And this is the peace available to the sons and the daughters of the living God, the peace that passes all understanding. And I found that right in the middle of my shadow, valley of the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death, God show me it's the shadow of death. For there to be shadow, there's gotta be light. So in your valley of the shadow of death, the light of God is still there with you, baby. He's still with you, baby. <laughs> Psalm 23, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. 
You've bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from and true to your word. You let me catch my breath and you send me in the right direction. And even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. The Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart. What do you believe? To find your attitude, girls, you've got to know what you believe. I found myself saying, God, you know what I believe. I believe you. I believe your word, your promise, blah. I was really super Christian to God. (laughs) I was. And then I felt him whisper to me, but do you believe that I love you? Daughter, I love you with an everlasting love. This has been a deepening, beautiful revelation in my heart. I've always known that I've been loved by God. But to be honest, cancer doesn't feel like love. And I had to really look at the scripture from a different point of view. Romans 8, as we've already seen tonight, for I am persuaded, neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities or powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us. No thing. What's come against you? What trial are you walking through? Can I tell you no thing? can separate you from the love of God. No weapon, no accusation, no fear, no intimidation, no past failings or even future glory, no disappointment, no setback, no thing. It's incredible to me. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, God Himself says to him, this, He kind of says to the world, this is my beloved Son. My beloved, my loved, the son of my heart, the beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He establishes his love for him. He establishes his identity. And then the enemy immediately tries to corrode that identity, to gnaw away at trust, birthed out of love that the father had for the son. And the enemy works the same way today. So my next lesson is this. My first one was my attitude. My second one was formed by this. We are completely loved. Completely loved. You go, oh, that's not a very good point. Well, it is if you don't feel loved. You are completely loved. Love is not only patient and kind. Love is tough. Love is resilient. Love is stronger than anything we can imagine. The kind of love I'm talking about is the kind of love that mothers find when there is a truck on their child and suddenly a mother gets on that truck and lifts that truck off that child because they love that child. That's love. I started Googling about mothers who have done these kind of things. I'm like, women love their children. (laughs) Oh my gosh, women are amazing. Seriously. God loves us. Jesus loves us regardless of whether we feel it or know it. I think about the love that God has for us, how His love held Jesus to the cross. His love held Him there for you and I. And what looked like death was swallowed up in victory. Jesus is our ultimate example of love of taking mourning, turning it into dancing, sorrow into joy, beauty for ashes. There is nothing in your life right now that God won't turn into good if you simply love and trust Him. See, I struggled with the thought of God loving me for that moment. I just went, what is this? Seriously? I'm just being honest. Is that all right? good. I could be up here and just pretend, but that's kind of not who I am. A few days later, we hadn't told our church, we just told our daughters and our key friends and our key leaders at church who came and anointed me with oil as we went into surgery and tried to kind of regroup and 
as you know, we didn't even really know the full diagnosis until after surgery, and then we had Christmas. And when I finally told one of the trusted prayer warriors in our church, and because she said, "What's troubling you? Something is troubling you." And I said to her, "Oh, Susanna, I've been told I have breast cancer, and I have to start chemo soon. It's very serious." This is what she says. She picks up this book. I bring it with me everywhere. She goes, oh, sweetheart, that's okay. I'm like, what do you mean that's okay? That's not okay. She goes, no, that's okay. The father started sharing with me scriptures about his love for you. He asked me to write them in a book. He's been downloading prophetic words for you, scriptures for you, all about his love for you. She said, he's got you. He's got this. And she popped this book in my hand and I'm like... And I've got to tell you, like July just passed, three years cancer-free, amen. <laughs> it's too good, it's just too good. But it's not many days go by that I don't find myself picking up my book, just reading the words of the Lord over myself. When I have pain in my body due to medication that I take, I read these prophetic words over my body and I remind my body who it belongs to and that I am loved completely in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, somehow I went right to the end of my message. Hang on, let me find it. See, knowing in my heart of hearts that Jesus truly and utterly loves me is actually very foundational to how I view this journey. He did not bring this sickness upon me. He does not bring sickness upon us to teach us lessons. We have an enemy. We have a fallen world that we live in. He does not bring this sickness upon me, but... He has allowed it, and therefore, because I know that he loves me, I can trust him with the journey. God's got it, God's got me, he's got my family. He knows because he loves me, amen? He loves you, the same applies to you. Third lesson, make room in your heart. What does this mean? God said to me, make room in your heart and as I waited on God, he started to show me that there was people in my heart that I really needed to forgive. I'm like, what? I thought I was good with that. I'm easy, I kind of, I have a good forgettery as well as a good forgivery. I'm quick to forgive and I kind of forget. Some people say to me, I'm so sorry about that thing I said and I'm thinking, I don't remember. <laughs> it's a blessing, it's a blessing. But he said, no, there's people you need to forgive. There's a declutter needed in your soul. So Jesus and I went on this long journey, weeping, just talking to him about things in my heart, things from when I was a child even that he just said, you just need to let that go and give it to me. All that disappointment, that hurt that you thought you had dealt with, he's like, you just, you're still holding on to it and your heart is cluttered with things that I wanna fill with much greater things. Girls, forgiveness is, is freedom. Unforgiveness is bondage. And I really encourage you, go on the journey with Jesus. He's a gentle shepherd when he's talking about his kids. He's that skull crusher when something comes against his kids. But when he's walking with his kids, he's a good, good father. Ephesians 4 says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as Christ forgave you. And I encourage you, forgiveness brings freedom. If you're looking for freedom, hey, take some time. Get on your knees with the father and just do the journey. Next lesson is time to speak what you believe. <laughs> You've all heard that saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, that's not how faith works. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain 
of what we do not see. Huh. What are you certain of even when you do not, do not see it? See, becoming certain in what you believe is not about striving, but it's like what Pastor Michelle said, it's about getting the Word into you so that you know what you can stand on when trouble comes your way. In 2 Chronicles 20, this amazing scripture that simply says this, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Knowing scriptures like this will truly give you your inner um, muscle to stand, your inner resolve to know what you believe. See, the people around me encouraged me, but it's been the Word of God that has held me. The Word of God, it's like, ah, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. I found on, on this journey that even Christians can be quite uncomfortable with my positive confession. They say, how are you doing? And I go, actually, I'm doing amazing, and I am. And they're like, oh, that's good. But what does the doctor say? <laughs> I'm like, can you not? Can you come with me and just stand with me? Stand with me and declare and believe God with me. Oh, so much I could say. In Job 23, we see Job, he knew the God whom he served. In verse eight, you sense that he can't feel God. But even though he can't feel God, he clings to what he knows. And this is what we've got to learn, church, is when storms come our way, we've got to cling to the truth and not bow to facts. We've got to cling to the truth to the name that is above every other name, including divorce and cancer and poverty. We gotta cling to the name of Jesus, amen. Job says, I go east, but he's not there. I go west, I can't find him. I don't see him in the north, he's hidden. I look to the south, but he's concealed. Oh, but he knows where I'm going. He, and when He tests me, I'll come out pure as gold. I've stayed on God's path. I have followed His ways and not turned aside. I have not departed from His commands, but I treasure His words more than daily food. He's a man who knew what he believed. It's not simply the power of positive thinking. It's speaking the truth over facts, declaring life over death in Jesus' name, in a world church that is grasping for hope. You can feel like the breathlessness in the air as people are gasping for some sense of hope. We've got to remember, we are carriers of hope. This hope we have is the anchor for our soul. And everyone said, amen, amen. You know, I've refused to Google my diagnosis. My children and my husband made sure of that, refused to fill my mind with the what ifs, refused to allow everyone's stories of people they knew that had done the cancer journey that had passed away. What is that about? So when someone is still alive, can you not go up to them and go, oh, my auntie had that. And you're like, oh, how's she doing? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not helpful. Not helpful, build faith, build faith. Come on, girls, come on. Know what you believe. I need to soak in the words He has given to me. Our youngest daughter, Zoe, she started to struggle with anxiety. And so up on her wall, we had painted, um, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. So that when that child went to sleep, that's the last thing she saw. When she woke in the morning, that's the first thing she saw. We've got to teach her how to believe and how to stand when the storm is rocking her boat. Amen. Amen. 
I declare that the finished work of Christ is exactly that, finished. I believe that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, because Christ is alive in me, sickness must flee. And I encourage you, church, speak out, sing out, announce and declare that God is with you in Jesus' Name. Amen. Woo! <laughs> Another thing, I guess for most of you, this is kind of normal, but I'll just say this, who you have around you in a crisis is really important. You need people around you who are gonna help you stay focused and, and fixed on the Word of God. You know, I, I offended some people while I was unwell, um, but that's okay. I had to kind of really be very careful of the atmosphere around myself and my children. Um, when people started to pray over me, and at first, my niceness, I'd go, I'd just listen, and they'd go, oh, God, if it's your will that my sister lives. I'm going, oh, my gosh. At first, I'd just go, huh, here we go. And my husband, it actually really affected me. And my husband said to me, honey, when people start to pray those prayers, I want you to find your voice and I want you to say, stop right there. I became very Spice Girls. Stop right now. Thank you very much. Very Spice Girls, my friends. <laughs> but you know, you've got to learn to protect your atmosphere, if it's your friend going through a trial, protect the Word of God around them and in and through them. You know, who you have around you in a crisis is really, really important. The Word of God became my best friend and is my best friend. In fact, actually one of my best friends one night flew down from um, another state and jumped into bed with me and made me listen to You Make Me Brave 1,000 times <laughs> so that I could do that last chemo because I was like, I can't do it. And she's like, you will do it and you'll lie in this bed and listen to this song and we'll turn it louder and sing it over and over until that worship is louder than your fears. So here we go. Now that is a good friend, amen? That is a good friend. <laughs> oh my Lord but I did it, and he did make me brave. Just Jesus. Psalm 91 is like my best friend. <laughs> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So good. The last verse in that says, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Another lesson, kindness is the new black. Kindness is invaluable when you are in need. You guys are so kind, seriously. You are the kindest church on the planet. I would say you're all just so, oh, honey, bless you. You're so beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to take you all home. You're so lovely. But I want to tell you this, kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. The Word of God tells us that they, the world, will know us, not by our theology, not by our placards, but the world will know us by our love. Kindness shouts. Kindness says you matter. Kindness says you are seen. Kindness says I will take the time to stand with you and listen to you. Kindness says, like I ask everyone now, can I pray for you? I don't care who, where they're from. I pray with everyone in the shopping center. I'm just the, I just pray now because I, I see it in people's eyes and they start to talk and open up and I just go, do you want me to pray for you? And they're like, would you? It's just taking a moment. Kindness takes time. I've got loads of stories of people that were just kind. Martin Smith, our dear friend, jumped on a plane from England and just came and stayed with us and sang over our church and walked with my husband and talked about the things that only mates can talk about when their wife is really sick. Hugged our kids. I mean, that is kindness. And the world looks on and sees. 
And they know us by our kindness, church. Let's be kind. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a personality trait. It's a fruit of the Spirit. When you need to be kind, you will find the anointing to be kind. Anointing simply means being smeared with his ability. Amen. Another lesson was just this. Great hair is not everything. I gave the girls some pictures of not bald, but me in a beanie, um, and just, it, oh, I was leading worship. That was my wig, Betty, and I just, <laughs> that was Betty, my wig, and I used to say, um, I hope I don't get sweaty, and in a, in a head move, it just <laughs> flies. <laughs> like, just, I would be fine, but how embarrassing for the poor person that it would land on. Anyway, yeah. There we go, my beautiful Ruthie Feather. Oh, sweet child. Last day of chemo. That was my daughter who put roses all across my car. I know, it was, it was a tough season. But you know, after my hair started falling out and it was time to shave it off and it fully just seemed cruel, although later I said to Mark, I am so glad that I'm not, you don't have to be so sick and do your hair. <laughs> so there is, you know, a golden side to that story. But here's the thing I want to tell you about that, is now I just worry less about those kind of things. You know, I, I take this medicine now that I have to take for 10 years, and it gives you a lot of pain and um, it bloats you up. But you know what, I just now, I just couldn't care less. I'm just like, no, I, that's awesome. I'm here. My husband thinks there's more of me to love, so hallelujah. <laughs> and, <laughs> but why I'm telling you that is I think there's probably women here today. There are things that you're unhappy about and you're worried about what you're wearing and who you're going to sit with and no one spoke to me. And, and then you feel inadequate. And Can I tell you today, Please don't wish away your days over the silly things. You know, hair schmear. You know, some days it's awesome. Some days it's like this. Some days you just wear hats. It's all good. It, you know, we can, you can buy nice things to wear for five bucks. You can go down at the thrift store and get amazing things. My daughters are teaching me all my new tricks. It's so good. It, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't compare yourself. It's like... Let, get in the lane of your life. Get before God and say, God, I'm just going to walk in my lane for you. Start loving the women around you. And I guarantee you're going to find yourself a whole lot more fulfilled in Jesus' name. If the team can come. Another little thing, encouragement is life. Do you know, sometimes it do, you don't know what to say to people. Maybe they've lost a child. Maybe they've prayed and the thing they prayed wouldn't happen has happened. And you don't know what to say. Do you know, when I went into radiation, oh, so many good God things to tell you, but anyway. Oh, that was so nice. <laughs> Isn't he amazing? <laughs> oh, you're so cool. Just like, bling. <laughs> but it was hard. And there are a few people, we were all doing radiation together, and on the journey, a couple of them passed away. It was really tough. But you know, to have people around saying, you can, you can do this. Come on, you get through this. You know, to, to not say anything and pull away because you don't know what to say is really hard. I, I encourage you to put courage into people. If you can't say anything face to face, write a card. Old fashioned way, old school, pen to paper. Say, we love you, we're thinking of you, we're here for you. You don't know what that does when you're walking through the fire. <laughs> Psalm 119 says, My comfort in my suffering is this, 
Your promise preserves my life. Now that is encouragement. Amen. Live with intention is another thing. All I say to this is be fully present. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says that God has given us plans and things to do and a hope for the future. Let's get about it, girls. Live with intention. Turn off the television. Stop watching everyone else's life on your feed. Get about your own life. Sometimes you've got to just put that thing down and get on with your own life. And the last thing, which is my favourite thing to say, God's presence is everything, everything. Do you know, without His presence, I just don't know how I would have done, how I would have worked this, walked this journey. It seems so dark at times, but the darkness doesn't scare Him. He just lights it up with His abiding presence. His atmosphere changing, love, life giving presence. See, I've learned from a young age that truthful worship truly does change everything. As I said, when I had no words, and still sometimes when I have no words, I just turn up that worship and allow those words, give me words to say. He carries us, my friend. My, my friend, Alicia Britt Sholey, says this. To worship in the light is a joy-filled act of faith. To worship in the dark is a faith-fueled act of war. Sometimes, girls, you just gotta worship for God is with you. I played worship wherever I could, whenever I could, as long as my girlfriend wasn't singing it in my ear. <laughs> and I led worship whenever I felt well enough. I wanted worship leaders around me not to tell me, spend five minutes before a song telling me how they feel about this next song. I said to our worship leaders at church, please don't speak, just sing. Just lead us in worship, can you please? And if you're gonna speak, can you say something that's gonna radically lift my heart toward heaven? In Jesus' Name. Psalm, 59, 16 says, I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. See, the song of the Lord is being heralded across the planet like never before. And we cannot just wait for all our circumstances to be right to sing and to worship. We've got to learn how to stand by faith and to declare the Word of the Lord. And it's so beautiful that the song of God often gives you the ability to speak out what is very hard to speak without the melody. I encourage you women, and I encourage you men in the room who are so awesome, to stand whenever you can and worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. I wanna finish by saying this. Firstly, if you need healing in your body, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I just feel that there is a anointing here right now that you're gonna be healed in this place. And that's nothing that I can do, but I just know that God is here. Amen, girls? If you are standing to your feet, I want you to lift your hands before heaven. Hallelujah. Father God, right now, if you've got someone standing to you, can you just gently place your hand on them? The Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will recover in Jesus' Name. Thank you, Father. The Word of God just says He sent His Word and healed them. So tonight I just declare by His stripes, you are healed, whether you have cancer, whether you have cold, whether actually I believe tonight that we have wombs that are gonna be restored, that when the doctor says that you are infertile, I speak fertility into your womb in Jesus' Name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We thank You that when You said it is finished, that's exactly what You meant. I thank You for the healing power of Jesus in Your mighty Name, in Your mighty Name. Just receive His healing. Just start to say, thank You, God that I am healed. Come on, say it together. Thank you, God. I am healed in Jesus' Name. Amen.
Amen. Can we give these girls a hand tonight? Amen. Amen. And in closing, you know, it'd be really remiss of me tonight to say all of this and not give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. You know, when I was 15, as I said, I prayed a simple prayer, but with all of my heart. I felt shame, I felt alone, I felt abandoned. And I just went before the Father at a meeting much smaller than this. And someone just said, does anybody here want to say yes to Jesus? It was like a dream come true, I've got to tell you. When I opened my heart and I literally just prayed a prayer, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Literally, everything changed. My life was still the same, but I've got to tell you from that day to this, I've never, ever walked alone. He's been with me every step of the way. And my friend, he loves you so much. There is nothing that you have done that could ever make God's face turn from you. His face is always towards you. His love is always towards you. He has so much love for you that He sent Jesus to die for you. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. It's not religion. God can't stand religion. He wants relationship. Relationship. Not going through the motions, not ticking boxes to please people. He just says, come as you are. Come as you are. So right where you're seated, I want every head bowed, every eye closed.